recording is now live. Okay, we are all here, I believe. Uh, welcome again to Odd Sex 30 and to Ian Calvert's talk, Intervening in Pope's Homer. Or, or at least we're going to listen to Ian intervene or to talk about the experience of intervening. Dr. Calvert is a lecturer in 18th century literature in the Department of English at the University of Bristol, so close and yet so far away from my home base in Bristol's Department of Theatre. Ian is up at the top of the Shining Hill and I'm down at the bottom. Uh, Ian's research focuses on the literary afterlives of classical texts and antiquity in the 17th and 18th centuries, especially in English translations of epic poetry. Ian's first book, Virgil's English Translators, Civil Wars to Restoration, came out with Edinburgh University Press in 2021, and it examines the print and manuscript translations of Virgil produced in the mid 17th century, with chapters on everyone from Godolphin to Robert Howard and several other poet translators that I know I never pronounced correctly, so I'm not even going to try today. He's also published on Dryden, who um, some people might be surprised to know also wrote some plays. Uh, Pope, uh, who wasn't really as friends with Colley Sibber, but should have been, because they're not as dissimilar as they like to think they were, and other poet translators. Today, he's talking to us about his current project, a new Oxford University Press edition of Pope's translation of Homer. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to Ian. Uh, take it away, Ian. Um, thank you very much, Elaine. That's a very kind introduction. And uh, greetings from the Shining Hill, the top of the Shining Hill um, at Bristol. Um, I'm just going to start sharing my screen uh, and then we can uh, get going. Um, Um, so hopefully you should all be able to kind of see that um, now. Um, so I'm going to kick off with uh, a recollection that uh, Pope offered uh, towards the end of his life uh, when it came to his experiences of translating Homer and the Iliad in particular. Um, he said, according to Spence, in 1743, the Iliad took me up six years, and during that time, I was often under great pain and apprehensions. Though I conquered the thoughts of it in the day, they would frighten me in the night. I dreamed often of being engaged in a long journey and that I should never get to the end of it. This made so strong an impression upon me that I sometimes dream of it still, of being engaged in that translation and got about halfway through it and being embarrassed and under dreads of never completing it. So the experiences that uh, Pope discusses here are ones with which I'm becoming increasingly sympathetic. Uh, as Elaine has just mentioned uh, with Professor Henry Power, who's at the University of Exeter, I am working on a new critical edition of Pope's translations of Homer for the forthcoming Oxford edition of the writings of Alexander Pope. And I very much feel like Pope says he feels here now, and we are nowhere near the halfway mark. Um, we're not that far really from the starting line. And actually the experience of editing Pope's Homer feels like one of those projects where the more of it that I do, the further away that I feel from the end. And what I'm hoping to do in the talk today is to um, kind of outline some of the reasons why I feel that um, sort of ever receding finish line um, as I move through uh, Pope's Homer. I'm going to be thinking about that in kind of um, very kind of quite technical terms um, by thinking about the necessity of an editor to explore uh, the hinterland of any text that they're working on. Um, and in Pope's case, how that particularly relates to the connections between his translation uh, and other texts, sort of other works that he's kind of engaging with. And I want to think about 
the complexities um, that lie in um, including those relationships and that dynamic within a print edition. But I also want to kind of open up um, those kind of questions uh, more broadly to uh, consider what they might have to tell us about Pope, about illusion and about influence and the type of illusions that Pope might be happy with um, us acknowledging as editors and others which he might not be so much. And rather than try and talk about the whole of Pope's Homer um, in one go, I'm going to be focusing on one uh, particular passage, one kind of quite short case study really, as a way into thinking um, about these, these questions. And also as a way of uh, articulating um, what I'm up against really, when it comes to editing Pope. Uh, so the uh, passage that I've chosen uh, is this one, uh, which comes from the second book uh, of the Iliad. As I said, we are quite near the starting line with this product. Uh, and this comes near the beginning of book two, where uh, the Greek army are rushing from the assembly place to their ships. And so what I've got here um, is the, the Greek, uh, which I've then uh, transliterated uh, and then um, underneath that is a fairly uh, kind of plain uh, translation, which I've adapted from the lobe. Right, so this is where the, the movement of the Greeks, the rushing of the Greeks from the, the plain to the ships is compared to a cornfield that's disturbed by um, uh, a gust of wind, right? Uh, so just as when the zephyr at its coming rushes upon the crop with its violent blast, and the ears of corn bow down, so was the whole assembly set in motion. Um, so it's these sort of two and a half lines um, that I'm going to be talking about really for, for the rest of the talk. This is the, as I say, fairly kind of plain uh, prose translation, just to give you a sense of, of what the Greek is saying. I'm now going to put that English version uh, alongside popes. Okay. Uh, and as on corn, when western gusts descend, before the blast, the lofty harvests bend. Thus, uh, the field, the moving host appears with nodding plumes and groves of waving spears. The material that I've put here in bold uh, represents moments that we might kind of think of as moments where Pope is intervening in the Homeric Greek text. Um, where he is adding material or where he's kind of altering it or, or kind of reshaping it in, in some way. And I'm going to kind of move through these um, particular moments um, in a moment or two. Um, but what I wanted to do first is just to sketch really uh, a kind of taxonomy of the kind of interventions that Pope um, is making here. Um, so I think we can categorize these interventions um, according to the kind of following um, uh, sort of practices, really. Uh, so we can think about them in terms of glosses or substitutions. We can think about them as amplifications. Some of them will be a term that I've nicked from uh, the recent TLS review of Emily Wilson's new Iliad translation, uh, these micro expansions. Uh, and we can also um, acknowledge that some of them uh, have connections to other texts. Um, by this, I don't want to suggest that these are um, only applicable to these four lines of Pope's translation. I think these um, apply kind of across the translation as a whole, or certainly the bits of the translation that I've been um, able to look at so far. Nor are these uh, mutually exclusive uh, categories at all. Um, there's often a, a high degree of overlap between them. And actually something that Pope does, I think, is, is have a particular intervention um, act in more than one category um, at once. Um, you know, an example of that um, might be um, that kind of first example there, right, where Western gusts as opposed to Zephyr. Uh, the Zephyr um, is the West wind. Uh, so, you know, it's just um, keeping that same reference, but slightly kind of reframing it. That's really a kind of a gloss um, or, or a substitution. Um, but it's also an amplification as well, right? The singular Zephyr has become the plural Western gusts. Uh, and that type of amplification is something that Pope does, you know, really right across the translation 
um, as a whole, like singulars become plurals, factors of 10 can become factors of 100 or even 1,000. Um, this is less relevant uh, for this particular moment in the translation, but by amplification, I don't just mean numerical amplifications. I also think we can see kind of emotional amplifications as well that happen. Um, individual words or phrases are added to uh, heighten the affect um, of a particularly uh, key scene. Um, the very kind of emotional um, last parting of Hector and Andromache at the end of book six is a really good example of that. There's that kind of emotional ratcheting up um, through these amplifications um, that Pope does very frequently. When I um, first sort of observed this shift from um, Zephyr to Western gusts, um, I initially thought um, it's a way of making the reference more immediately um, accessible to readers of the translation who don't have the same access to classical mythology uh, that Pope did, right? You, you replace the very specific reference to the mythological being Zephyr to a much more kind of general one of, of, of the West wind or Western gusts. But actually, if you look across the translation as a whole, Pope is perfectly happy to use the word Zephyr at various points. Um, so as well as Western Gus being a kind of gloss and indeed an amplification, it's also a sort of micro expansion. Um, I think this is a change that Pope is making, not because he doesn't want to use the word Zephyr. It's just that Zephyr doesn't have the right number of syllables um, at this particular moment. Right? He's using Western gusts rather than Zephyr to um, kind of round out the line. Uh, so I guess a, a, a less polite way of referring to micro expansions um, would be as filler, right? That Western gusts has something of the air of the kind of filler to it. Um, and that's also true of um, what's happening in the third line as well, right? That reference to uh, the field, the moving host appears. Um, uh, the field has no prompt in the Greek at all. It's not really adding any information, but it does mean that the line is of the requisite length. This sort of thing happens all the time in um, translation, particular translation um, of kind of Greek and Roman poetry into English poetry because of things like syllable counts. I also think it's worth stressing a very obvious point, but of course, Pope is an extremely technically accomplished poet. Um, when we do have these moments of, of micro expansions um, of filler, they don't feel like filler. Um, they're not obviously moments where Pope is just bringing up the syllable count to the, the requisite number. It's only by doing that very close line for line comparison um, that I'm doing here that we um, can kind of recognize these, these micro expansions, these sort of moments of filler um, for, for what they are. So all those, those things, kind of glosses, amplifications, micro expansions offer their own um, kind of challenges maybe if you're uh, editing a text or trying to kind of represent them succinctly or even thinking about whether you want to represent them at all in your commentary. Where things get particularly um, dicey perhaps is that kind of fourth uh, uh, example I've given there, the kind of connections to other texts, um, which is where the interventions in line two and line four come in. Um, so I want to spend a bit more time on those than I have on the ones in, in one and three. Uh, so to take the one in line two first, uh, that reference to uh, lofty harvest, um, this is exactly the sort of change, the type of intervention that critics of Pope will often single him out for, right? In Homer, it's just ears of corn. Uh, so Pope has taken that plain, quote unquote, noble simplicity uh, of the Homeric Greek and has made it more quote unquote poetic, right? He's, he's changed a, a literal reference for a more metaphorical one by referring to the corn as lofty harvests. I think the reason that he does that is not just because of his general practice of, um, of heightening and of using kind of metaphorical language because he's an 18th century poet. It's also a sign of his reading um, and how that is informing the text that he's making at this particular point because I think that reference to lofty harvests is indebted to this passage, which is also concerned with a cornfield that is being disturbed by um, a gust of wind, right? in this case, Boreas, the north wind, not Zephyr, the west wind. Like Boreas in his race, 
and rushing forth, he sweeps the skies and clears the cloudy north. The waving harvest bends beneath his blast. The forest shakes, the groves their honours cast. So this passage is from Dryden's translation of Virgil's Georgics. Um, so as well as writing some plays, Dryden also translated some Virgil. Um, uh, and I think by putting the Virgil translation alongside a kind of plain translation of the Homer and Pope's own version, we can see that reference in, in Pope's second line owing much more or feels much closer to Dryden's translation of Virgil than it does to the Homeric original in terms of its vocabulary and to some extent its kind of structure as well. That in itself is not at all surprising. Um, Pope quotes Dryden and particularly Dryden's Virgil all the time uh, across the translation, whether or not Dryden's um, presence in the translation is something that Pope wants us to directly kind of acknowledge or reference is another matter. And I'll come to that kind of shortly. Um, but you know, you can hardly open a page of Pope's translation and not find some kind of connection uh, to Dryden, and particularly Dryden's Virgil in some form or another. What complicates matters a bit in this particular example um, is that Dryden's translation of Virgil's Latin is itself quite an expansive one, and it has its own connections to other texts than the one in which it is immediately engaging with. I think in terms of its, its own vocabulary, its own sentence structure, Dryden is translating Virgil through this passage of Paradise Lost, where Satan is cornered in Eden by angels with ported spears, as thick as when a field of Ceres ripe for harvest waving bends her bearded grove of ears, which way the wind sways them. So just as Pope is engaging with Homer through Dryden, it does feel like Dryden is engaging with Virgil through Milton. What complicates things further is if things weren't complicated enough, is that I think it's very clear, and indeed has been written about, that Milton in Paradise Lost at this particular moment is engaging with precisely the moment of Iliad II that Pope is himself translating. And there are various moments across the translation where Pope is interested in what we might think of as a kind of feedback loop of illusion or a kind of feedback loop of intertextuality. That Pope wants to acknowledge and recognize the literary traditions that Homer gave birth to by translating Homer through those intermediary texts. And chief among those intermediary texts for Pope are writers like Virgil and Dryden and Milton. And so there's this quite complicated blurring of past and present of original and translation um, at various points in, you know, across the text. And, and this might well be one of those, even if there's not quite that same precise textual um, uh, similarity or kind of taking is that there will be a, a more kind of formal um, allusions or, or quotations. And as I was working on this, I, I did sort of wonder, because in some ways it's quite helpful for my argument that if Pope knows about the Miltonic imitation in his own, of his own accord, right, not just through Dryden's borrowing, whether or not Milton's waving grove of ears informs Pope's groves of waving spears. But actually, for that final line in the Pope here, that fourth line, there is another um, textual connection um, that is going on here that is closer to that of the Dryden and the Milton that I've just been talking about. And it's this passage, which is um, about the gathering of an army. Uh, on Sorbio Dunum's plains, armed youth appears with nodding plumes and moving groves of spears. So as I say, this feels much closer, that final line, nodding plumes and moving groves of spears, than that um, important, but I think perhaps vaguer hinterland of Milton, of Virgil and of Dryden. This passage, doesn't come from Milton, it doesn't come from Dryden, it doesn't in fact come from the type of poets that we might expect uh, Pope to be wanting to, um, to sort of engage with in his translation, because it comes from Prince Arthur, 
So the first of the many, many epics written by the physician and poet Sir Richard Blackmore. That's the same Richard Blackmore who Pope investigates in the Dunciad. It's the same Richard Blackmore who Pope um, quotes from extensively in Peribethus, right? His treatise on poetic bathos. And I do find it very striking that of all the uh, sort of potential or, or likely intertexts uh, at this moment in the translation, by far the closest and the most direct is one from Blackmore, the type of poet whom Pope will castigate as a hack and as a dunce and as somebody without poetic merit, as opposed to a writer like Milton or Dryden or Virgil. So I think you know, there's lots that's really interesting kind of um, about that. And there's also the question of like, what do we, what do we make of this? Or how do we, how do we interpret this? And one kind of reading of this kind of event, not this precise moment, but um, this type of practice um, is offered by um, Edward Young, who um, this is again recorded in Spencer's observations. Young is thinking specifically about Pope's Homer at this moment, because he says that Pope was so superior to all the poets, his contemporaries in versification, that if he met with a good line, even in a much inferior, he would take it like a lord of the manor for his own. So there's something very kind of proprietorial, you know, kind of lordly about encountering lines wherever he kind of finds them, whether they're in good poets or bad poets, uh, or poets he thought of as bad, perhaps on a kind of poetic stopped clock principle. Um, that even Blackmore is occasionally capable of writing a line that is worthy of um, imitation uh, or, or borrowing from. And I do see what Young means here, um, but I do think it's it is more kind of complicated that than that, given that he is not only taking in this proprietorial, lordly way lines from Blackmore. Um, he is also taking from writers like Milton and Dryden and others like Denham and Waller and Cowley, with whom Pope is much more likely to want to align himself with. And there's something about what does it mean to identify a borrowing that Pope himself doesn't signal or acknowledge as coming from Milton or Dryden. In some ways, that kind of suits Pope's purposes, that he doesn't do that work himself. It's readers who do it for him. But I don't think quite the same thing applies to a modern day reader or an 18th century reader um, recognizing this, this borrowing um, at all. Um, what this also means, I think, and why we might want to kind of complicate what, um, what sort of Young's version of Pope as a, as a borrower, as a, as a taker of other text here, is that Pope himself has some very strong words to say elsewhere in the translation about borrowing without recognition. He's not thinking about the text of the translation itself. Um, he is, in fact, thinking about the notes, um, the notes which are as extensive as the, uh, the translation of Homer um, itself. Uh, towards the beginning of the notes of the first book, so a kind of fairly programmatic um, statement uh, of his intentions with his notes. Um, Pope says this. The chief design of the following notes is to comment upon Homer as a poet. Whatever in them is extracted from others is constantly owned. The remarks of the ancients are generally set at length and the places cited. All those of Eustathius, Eustathius is a, a 12th century scholar, He's the, editor, he's the writer of a, a monumental uh, edition um, of, uh, of the Iliad and the Odyssey, um, which he uses a lot in his own notes, right? So all those of Eustasius, that medieval commentator, are collected, which fall under this scheme. Many, which were not acknowledged by other commentators, are restored to the true owner, and the same justice is shown to those who refused it to others. So just as in some respects with, say, Milton, Dryden and Virgil, Pope might like to think of himself as restoring a passage to its true owner, so in the notes is he restoring a comment to its true owner in the way that some of his intermediaries, the way that some of his predecessors as commentators have not done. Right? So Pope himself sets himself up 
as a very uh, diligent uh, citer of sources. And at various points across the translation, he castigates other commentators on Homer for not doing the same thing. And one writer who he particularly does this for is his contemporary, near contemporary, uh, the French commentator and translator of Homer, um, Madame Dacier. And there's lots of examples of, of this that kind of across the, the translation. This is just uh, one of them. Um, uh, in book five, uh, he sort of engages with a, a line or a, a kind of comment from Dacier's own uh, version of Homer, and then says that final sentence at the top there, Madame Dacier should have acknowledged this remark to belong to Eustathius. He's kind of pulling up Dacier for including a comment that she has taken from Eustathius but not acknowledged that she's done that. What this is, of course, is a spectacular example of a pot calling the kettle black. Um, as I've said already, right, Pope does not acknowledge in any kind of paraphernalia or kind of into, um, or, you know, his own notes when he's engaging with um, other poets in the text of his translation, nor in his notes does he say when he is um, engaging with authors all the time. This is something that has been noted um, quite crossly, understandably quite crossly, by a previous editor um, of Pope's Homer, uh, Gilbert Wakefield. Uh, so Wakefield's edition came out in uh, 1796, uh, and it includes a commentary, um, both on the text of the translation itself and also Pope's own notes. So we get notes on notes. Uh, and, and this is an example of, of one of those notes on notes. Um, so he, he quotes that same uh, comment from Pope, Dacier should have acknowledged this remark to belong to Eustathius. And then Wakefield says, this censure of Madame Dacier occasions much surprise to the prejudice of our translator, who has borrowed from others every note that contains one particle of ancient learning without a single exception to the best of my belief and yet does not acknowledge the obligation one time in six. So I don't know the precise ratio, um, whether it kind of maps onto Wakefield's one in six, um, but the broader point is absolutely true, that there are moments where Pope does cite his sources in the notes, where he says he is quoting from Dacier or Eustathius or other early modern commentators like Ogilby or Spondanus. There are many, many moments where he is essentially cutting and pasting a comment from one of those earlier commenters without acknowledging that that's what he's doing. So there are some glossed references, but many are not. Many are much more silent, just as they are in the text of the translation itself. There's a, a kind of another way um, of thinking about Pope's practice here um, as a Kind of engager of other texts in his translation, not in Wakefield's 18th century edition, but in a more recent and indeed really the only other um, uh, critical edition uh, of uh, Pope's Homer, which is the volumes of the Twickenham edition, uh, the four volumes under the general editorship of Maynard Mack uh, that are dedicated to the Iliad and the Odyssey. So these are published in um, the 1960s, right, 1967, and in his introduction uh, to uh, these four volumes, Maynard Mack reflects on the status of Pope's Homer as a work that is connected to a very high number of other texts at a very local level, as well as at a more general one. And he's, he reflects on sort of what to do with them, what we should call them, how to acknowledge them. And he says this, that those moments of connection to other texts are not in any precise rhetorical sense, illusions. We cannot assume that all or perhaps any of them are intended to be noticed. They occur by the hundreds in a verse whose vocabulary and content are potentially elusive at every moment, being derived from all the poets Pope had ever read, right? All the poets Pope had ever read. Perhaps the most that we may legitimately say of them is that they are the islands and small peaks whose thrusting above the surface here, there, and everywhere gives us hints of the size of the submerged continent below. So unlike Wakefield's 1796 edition of the Homer, the Twickenham edition doesn't include 
a commentary, but what it does do is recognize or gesture towards those islands and small peaks of the vast submerged continent of these intertextual references um, in an appendix. Uh, so I'm talking here again about the, the text of the translation itself rather than the notes, but I do think it also applies to the notes as well. So what the um, Twickenham edition does is give this appendix of parallels to um, other translations from Homer, which I've not talked about at all today, but also clearly an important um, other set of texts that Pope is, is consulting and working with. That's on the left. And then on the right, we see the beginnings of um, section two of the appendix, which outlines um, connections to, say, Paradise Lost, Dryden's Aeneid, the Bible, and other works of poetry. Before I say anything else, I want to say that the uh, Twickenham edition of the Homer is an extraordinary act of scholarship. It's kind of monumental in all kinds of ways. The work that it does on establishing text, on uh, finding particular kind of sources that Pope cites, uh, the introduction that Matt writes is, um, you know, is extraordinary. It's very, very lengthy. It's basically a book in itself. So all that said, I also want to say that this is perhaps not the most useful or helpful way of indicating the ways in which Pope is engaging with other texts, right? It only gives the line numbers, it doesn't give the text itself. This leaves an awful lot of work up to the reader. And as Mack had kind of managed our expectations in his introduction, these parallels make no attempt at kind of comprehension at all. Um, all of the examples that I've spoken about today are not recorded um, either in Wakefield's edition or in the Twickenham edition either. So what we're kind of hoping to do with our new edition um, is to perhaps reveal a bit more of that submerged continent that Mac referred to. Um, you know, I absolutely take his point to go back to, to Mac's claim that we cannot assume that all or perhaps any of them are intended to be noticed, but I think that's something different than not noting them in a critical edition. In fact, I think it's the, the type of connections to say Blackmore's Prince Arthur, the Pope is very unlikely to want people to recognize as an illusion that can tell us the most about Pope's practice as a translator and what he thinks he's doing in the Homer translation as well. At the same time, I'm also very conscious that we don't want our edition to start to look like the Dunciad, with the footnotes marching their way with ever increasing confidence um, towards the top of the page, right? that there is a kind of wood for the trees syndrome that we need to think about um, when it comes to this, um, this sort of thing, given that, as Mac says, it is potentially elusive at every moment, and given the resources of 21st century editors relative to 20th or 18th century editors, we can start to kind of reveal some of those moments a bit more extensively. So I wanted to kind of close um, my, uh, my talk by putting my money where my mouth is, really, um, and start to think about how some of the issues that I've described today might look in the critical edition that uh, we're working on. So one version of that passage, those four lines of Pope, might look something like this, where I've not provided a gloss for Western gusts as a substitution for Zephyr. That would probably feel slightly too... Um, pedantic. But what I have done is include um, the Greek for the following line to indicate how Pope is departing from it in various ways, and also include the references to the Georgics and to Paradise Lost as likely passages that Pope himself is drawing on or kind of thinking about um, at various ways as he's putting that line together. I have included um, the recognition that uh, the field is an addition to the Greek. Um, and then I've, in the final line, uh, signposted that uh, stronger, more direct connection to Blackmore's Prince Arthur. What I am very keenly aware of is that these are four lines in a translation that is many, many, many thousands of lines long. And not only is there the translation to contend with, there are also Pope's own notes and observations. As has been pointed out more than once, there is more prose than poetry in Pope's Homer as it is first published, and the notes are as part of the volume as the text of the translation itself is, and we do 
both a disservice if we separate the one from the other. That means there is an incredible pressure on space in the six volumes that we have at our disposal um, to produce both the Iliad and the Odyssey, right? Three volumes for the Iliad, three volumes for the Odyssey. That means I wouldn't be surprised if ultimately, as we were working on this, we would have to reduce this type of intervention quite radically. And it could potentially end up as looking something a lot more like this second version where I'm not bringing in the references to Dryden or to Milton or acknowledging the additions, but just focusing on what is the clearest, most direct intertextual connection at this particular moment. Right? As this is a fairly transitory moment in the text. This is not a moment that Pope himself is signaling as a, as a high point of the translation or, or one that he um, or one that finds its way really into kind of later anthologies where perhaps we might want to kind of dedicate more editorial space to. And so as I was thinking about what type of information as an editor we need to include here, what type of interventions we need to make onto Pope's text, just as Pope makes interventions into Homer, it made me think about how any critical edition that I've used or that I might be kind of involved in working on, however extensive or selective its annotations are, that they are themselves reflective of that vast submerged continent of editorial work, of editorial labour that has gone into their appearance in those kind of editions, that these can only represent, um, to continue with Max's metaphor, the kind of isolated islands or outpeaks of all of the work that could potentially could go into um, an edition. Uh, and it's on that quite self-pitying note about the lot of um, the editor that I'm going to uh, finish talking. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Let's give a warm uh, round of thanks to Ian for that wonderful trot through the challenges of intervening in Pope's Homer and, and Pope's own interventions in his predecessors and his contemporaries, um, those both loved and loathed. Can I open the floor to questions? We had one question during the chat. Uh, Julia Gasper wanted to ask about the tone of Edward Young's comments. Um, can you talk a little bit about the poetic bitchiness? I, I think it is what you're being asked about. Yeah, what I, what I also think Young is doing here um, is kind of making an illusion of his own, right? Because this what Young says about Pope as taking a line like a lord of the manor is very similar to what Dryden says about Ben Jonson's practice as a, um, an editor. He says, like, what is theft in others is only victory in him. Um, so again, this is very kind of complex <laughs> triangulation of, you know, of, of multi-triangulation of, of Johnson. So Ben Johnson, Dryden, Pope, and Young there, right, where they're sort of aligning themselves with traditions and also sort of trying to extricate them from that as well. Um, you know, Young had been a big um, kind of supporter of Pope's Iliad. You know, he's based in Oxford. He kind of recruits for subscribers in that. So he clearly likes the, the edition kind of in some ways. But he's also wanting to point out maybe that he's a kind of better reader of Pope <laughs> than anybody else is, or he's a more kind of discerning reader of Pope. And that he is taking a kind of pleasure in unearthing certain passages. So Young is thinking not about Blackmore, but about um, a line from Ambrose Phillips. But again, it's a sort of broader point, right, that he's, you know, that's a poet that Pope castigates in one place, but is perfectly happy to um, to borrow from elsewhere. Felicity Rosslyn did some really interesting work on this um, when it comes to an, the rival translation of Homer that's produced by Thomas Tickell in 1715. Only gets as far as book one. Pope's really kind of mean about it. And yet, in the later editions of book one of the Iliad, Pope has silently corrected or amended his text to incorporate references from Tickell. So this is a, a wider kind of network of things that's, that's going on. Thank you. See also Shakespeare editing. <laughs> it's a similar practice. Uh, Karen, do you want to uh, ask your question directly? <laughs> 
Sure, thank you very much. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I am I'm just beginning my um, my PhD thesis on women translators, so I'm thinking of a lot of these networks of affiliation, um, text, textual and authorial. I was wondering if you thought that uncovering some of these unacknowledged allusions, especially to figures who have been denigrated, um, might help to encourage scholars to re-examine those people. I'm thinking of particular John Ogilby. Um, and you know, I did a little um a little project on uh various translations of Aeneid and and notice that you know Dryden borrows extensively from Ogilby. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I um, there's a chapter of um, my book which is on Ogilby and Ogilby as a translator, um, which meant I have read his various versions of the um, Aeneid and also his Iliad and his Odyssey. Um, and so whether this is just sort of Stockholm syndrome or something kind of speaking, but like I think he's not as bad as people say he is. Like, or at least you know he's um, he's a is a perfectly kind of serviceable, decent couplet translation of, of kind of classical epic, um, and yet it suits other writers' purposes to kind of portray him as a, as a hack or, or as a dunce when, when they're not, actually. Um, yeah, he's maybe not, doesn't sort of ascend to the same kind of heights, maybe as, as Dryden's Aeneid or, or Rose Lucan or, or, or Pope's own Homer. But yeah, there's a lot, um, there's a lot of Ogilby and Dryden. There is also a lot of Ogilby's Homer in Pope's Homer as well, um, both in the text and also in the translation. Partly that comes directly, I think, but also something that I discovered, other people may have known this before, but I didn't, that there's the, the English translation of the Dacier um, Homer by Azel, Broom and Aldersworth, right, the English, it's an English blank verse translation, but it's set as prose. That is full of cut and paste jobs from the Ogilby translation, like it's, you know, they take whole sentences from that. Um, so, yeah, kind of Ogilby's both a kind of a, a silent and a kind of a not so silent presence at various moments. He does it with the notes as well. Sometimes he will quote Ogilby directly. Other, like he'll say, no, I owe this note to Ogilby. Other times he just takes a note from Ogilby and doesn't say it. So um, hopefully this does cause some kind of revision, at least when it comes to, say, translators like, like Ogilby. I may be less sure we can say the same about Blackmore, just given that there's just so many of them and they're just such hard work. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Stephen, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, uh, th thank you, Ian, very much for your talk, um, which I enjoyed um, while also uh, sh sharing your uh, concern about the daunting uh, nature of your task. Um, I'm, I'm curious to, to, if, for you to follow up on something you actually just alluded to, which of course was uh, were the changes that Pope made to his translation, uh, so the revisions to the translation, and to what extent you're planning uh, on the edition having, uh, you know, the history of the changes, whether in the text uh, that is in the verse or in the notes, uh, to the, uh, you know, the evolution of the uh, of Pope's Homer. Um, so I'm just curious about to what extent you're, you're going to grapple with that, and then, of course, how you're planning to do it. Yeah, um, so I guess there's a sort of several kind of parts to that. Um, maybe the first thing to say is that we are basing the text on the first print edition of the Iliad. Obviously, there is the manuscript that exists, um, but I think we felt that to try and engage with those changes from manuscript to print, within the space that we have that's available just wouldn't be possible. And that's really the only thing that we could do. You know, we'd have to take up all the space to, to kind of to do that. Um, and as a kind of related point, what we are doing absolutely is kind of, it's a critical edition. We're going through all the, 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 the lifetime print editions of the Homer that, um, that appeared. What we are not doing is tracking every single example of the evolution of it as a printed text from 1715 to the 1743 editions in terms of its italicizations, its capitalizations, its use of kind of punctuation. Because again, that would that would take up all the available space that we had. What we will, what we're currently planning on doing is having 
a section of the introduction that gives a kind of representative sample of the type of practices that shift over time um, within those lifetime print editions. Um, and again, it's always a question of if there's a particularly significant kind of change when it comes to those matters, we'd probably want to record that in the annotation, but deciding which of those is significant, which is not, is perhaps more up for grabs. And there's also something that I'm grappling with. There are mercifully few textual changes, actually, um, at least in the early books, the ones that I've kind of looked at so far. Book one has quite a fair few. Um, that's the one he seems to kind of um, fiddle with the most over time. Um, but actually sort of beyond that, there are only a few sort of isolated kind of couplets here and there. And if you look at the, the collation that's been done by the Twickenham and also by Stephen Shankman for his edition for Penguin, records them. So those aren't too significant or aren't too major, but also because there aren't that many of them, we also sort of want to acknowledge the fact or should we acknowledge the fact that he's made a kind of a change here and what changes are significant, um, including, for example, moments where he is amending based on the fact that people have criticised the translation or that there's a Tickell version that he's um, incorporating that in. So, so that's a very long response. So some things, yes, we're acknowledging, other things we're not, other things it's much more up for grabs. And that's where the really real difficulties lie. Right, we've got a question in the chat from Courtney and then Joseph has his hand up. Courtney, do you wanna ask your question? Sure, I'll just read what I wrote. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. I'm really excited about this edition being in the world. Um, I I was I'm thinking about what your or what your example helps us see about Pope's way with poetic diction. Uh, so I noticed that many of the examples that you were pushing on were basically paraphrastic in structure. So the adjective noun, which is of course something 18th century poetry is often villainized for lofty harvest, nodding plumes. Um, oh, I might've gotten one of those wrong, but you'll forgive me. Um, but then I was also thinking about Thomas Gray's idea that English poetry has the language peculiar to itself. Uh, and he said, Shakespeare and Milton have been creators this way and no one more licentious than Pope or Dryden who perpetually borrow expressions from the former. Uh, so I just wanted to hear you speak a little about how your approach to the poem might shed some light on Pope's thinking about poetic language and language itself. Seems generative. Um, this is another one of my sort of hobby horses that I could potentially kind of go on about. I've, I've sort of had on the back burner now for about the last kind of four or five years, some work on kind of poetic diction and, and what we mean by poetic diction in the 18th century. And like, I often feel like poetic diction gets like Ogilvy, I was saying earlier, a real kind of unfair press, right? That like it's often being considered as something that's kind of mechanical or rote um, by poets who are kind of more interested in um, looking to kind of poetic predecessors than describing the thing that they're actually trying to kind of talk about, right? They don't want to call a spade a spade. They want to call it, you know, the tool of Pomona or something. Um, but actually when, and obviously when it's done badly or ineffectively, it can kind of have that sort of deadening effect. But in writers like Pope or Dryden, they are using terms like nodding plumes or lofty harvests, finny courses, right, is another kind of classic one of those, right? Like in very precise and kind of specific ways. And what they're often doing is precisely to kind of conjure up a more vivid mental picture for the reader. Um, and sometimes, particularly, a lot of these come from Georgic, right, the kind of the adjective noun, and it's about thinking about the incongruity of the two things um, and the energy that derives, so the, the generative energy that derives from putting those words together. And we're meant to recognize them as being unusual. They're also like the individual examples often get kind of trotted out as being things you see all the time. Once you start to look for them, or at least when I start to look for them on, you know, Lion or Ebo or Echo, they really don't appear as often as people say they do. Well, the, certainly the examples that people give as kind of paradigmatic ones don't. Um, uh, Chris Baldick in the Dictionary of Literary Terms gives glittering forfex as an example of um, poetic diction, which occurs once in one poem, which is The Rape of the Lock, where it's thinking very much about the relationship between kind of the large and the small, right? It has a very particular kind of resonance. And so I confess I haven't done that same type of work for the metaphorical poetic diction language of, of the Homer, but 
I'm sure that there will be examples that kind of counter this, but there are other work where Pope is really wanting us to think about the precise mental picture that he is producing for us, which, if you'll allow me, like, is maybe a bit of a stretch. That's what the ancients say is so good about Homer. They say that Homer produces a picture in the mind through his language. I think Pope is trying to do something similar, and the diction can help with that. Joseph, I'm get you before that before the hour. Hi everyone. Um, thanks, Ian. Um, I mean that was that was magnificent. Not self pitying at all. Um, I'm I'm really excited by by what this edition is going to do, um, and I'm also thinking here about Pope's books. So, like we know, I think the Twickenham. I, if memory serves me right, in the Twickenham. There's kind of references to Pope's annotations of Chapman, Homer. But we know that there's that anecdote in Spence where, you know, Pope sits back in his office and says, oh, by the way, those are the two volumes of Homer that I did to do my translation. Um, and there's Hobbes's translation, which is all you know, covered in annotation that Mac couldn't get hold of that. I can't remember when that was sold, but it's, it's somewhere now. Um, and there's, he's got so many copies of the Iliad and the Odyssey, and all of them seem to be packed with doodles. Um, are those going to feature any? Are you going to are you going to draw on those? You've said no to manuscripts, but what about reading notes? That's my question. Yeah, I know. Maybe this is also a sign of like when I began work on this project, which was during lockdown, <laughs> so I could only do kind of desk based um, research. But you're absolutely right that you know we do have when it comes to the Homer, a real kind of richness in terms of the resources of looking at how Pope is using, engaging with those texts. And again, I guess it comes to that issue of, we'd want to record them when they're significant, but then how do we define what's significant? And that's something that, you know, that will give me sleepless nights on, but you're, you know, you're absolutely right. We have this kind of patterns of use and I feel it's a really important growing strand sort of in reception history more broadly, but particularly in 18th century reception history, about like the ways in which readers are engaging with their texts. And of course, we have to think about how Pope is doing that as well. Um, but are those, you know, are those reflecting the ones that Pope himself deems significant? Or is he, you know, is he himself sort of trying to include from himself moments where he's borrowing? It's such a, you know, I'm getting very self-pitying again. It's a really, it's a really fascinating minefield, but it's a minefield nonetheless. <laughs> That's why you're paid the big bucks, Ian. That's the, you, <laughs> the judgment. That's what we want. You decide. I'm going to be horribly selfish and use chair's privilege to ask the last question because I've been sitting on this question since about minute 10. Um, and Ian, I want to ask you about kind of about, about memory and scholarly practice and the kind of the challenge that Pope has that he read a lot of schlock on purpose to write the Dunciad and because, you know, he thought it was funny and things get stuck in your head and the kind of accidental illusion that might, um, that, you know, King Arthur might not have been an intentional thing. It might just, that phrase, it's a bit of a stop clock, but also sometimes things just get stuck in your head and you can't remember where those from. And then there's also the things that you have read informed what you see and what you draw from. And I was thinking you were you mentioned how frequently Pope is is going to Dryden's Virgil, which I know you know more about than anyone else in the world. So therefore, are you seeing that because you're primed to see it rather than because it was, you know, more there than other things that you might not be looking for as avidly? Yeah, I mean, it's something that I'm really conscious of. And again, I, you know, as somebody who likes Pope, and who likes Pope enough to kind of want to spend some time with the Homer, or the amount of time that I will. But I have a particular example of who I think Pope is as a poet, which is somebody who is very actively engaged in aligning himself with a particular form of literary tradition, of which Dryden's Virgil is absolutely kind of part of that. And so something that I really do try and do is not just kind of present a Pope that is in my own image, that I, I try as much as possible to be as you know, because of resources like Echo now, where you, you can kind of track certain kind of phrases, really kind of looking at, is that what's going on there or is it not? Like, and that's why maybe in my kind of second example, I sort of remove the Dryden and the Virgil because it's not quite as 
I can't pinpoint it in quite the same way as I feel more confident saying with the Blackmore. Of course, where the Black, I suppose I can kind of subcontract this out game. Well, like here's some kind of connection to the Blackmore. And I, I'm, I'm having the abbreviation CP for compare do a lot of heavy interpretative lifting, right? I'm really conscious of that. And they're like, well, it's like this. Could I call this an illusion? Like, is that something that Pope is deliberately recognizing? Is it something that he's not? That if I ever write a monograph on illusion in Pope's Homer, I'd have to kind of dedicate paragraphs to, but in the edition, there the limitations of space can perhaps work in my favor. Um, and just on, finally, just on that kind of Blackmore point, right? So Blackmore is a subscriber to the first edition of the Iliad. Right? So he reads book two. And I feel like if Blackmore himself had noticed that Pope was taking these lines from him, that he would have said something about it, <laughs> right? Like, so, I mean, either Blackmore just didn't read the Iliad, which is fair enough. Like lots of people haven't read Pope's Iliad. Um, or he had read it and he himself hadn't noticed. The Pope is doing the songs. Again, Blackmore writes seven epics. He's not going to be able to remember all of them. But like, so just on that point of Pope not necessarily knowing where it's coming from, there's also this potential that like the people that he is borrowing from himself don't recognize it as a borrowing from their own works. Or it's it's flattery that despite calling him a dunce, he still thought he was good enough to plagiarize, which was certainly Sivers' position on Pope. And, and with Blackmore, like the main hostilities are from the 1720s onwards, right? So this is 1710s. So perhaps they hadn't quite had the falling out. That <laughs> So whether when it comes to the Odyssey, which is done after their falling out, whether there are those same kind of buried illusions or not, time will tell. <laughs> and time will, will, will tell for us as well. We are at the end of the hour. Can I just ask everyone to once again give Ian a resounding uh, round of applause? And thanks for kicking off a year of odd sex in such fantastic and brilliant style. Thank you again, Ian. Thank you very much. And thank you for listening. <laughs>